Are you talking to me? No, you, you, you. Who am I? The book is mainly a collection of communal and personal memories. So personal meaning my own memories, things that have happened to me and various things I've seen in a communal space. Uh, through the years, the first version of this book was completed in 2017. What I had done at that time was to write certain things, um, part of my history, part of my stories. Um, one of such stories was of the time when my mom uh, had to come back home from work by around 12. And when she came back, she met me uh, sick. And rather than rest, she carried me straight to the hospital, which was like about an hour away. And um, after all the things that happened, she still carried me back to the house. And by around 4 a.m., she had to go back to work because she was working double shifts. So things like that, things like the various killings in Benway, um, things that are happening in various places, I put all of them together and then put it into this collection. I think another thing I was trying to do with this collection was to demystify some experiences for, for people because there's this Jack Barry, everybody wants to go abroad and once uh, people go abroad, they, they see certain realities that, ref that they refuse to tell people at home. For instance, depression is very real abroad. Suicide is real. People get really tired. People don't have things exactly as they want it to be. So this whole book was trying to demystify experiences too. And then at the end of it, or most importantly, to give people hope, to know them, to let them know that, okay, despite everything that is happening, there's always hope. And as long as we keep believing, something good is going to happen to all of us. Okay. This, uh, yeah, yeah. this both of them is good and is bad. Because there's nothing that is really totally bad. There's nothing that is really totally good. It's good in the sense that there are certain things you cannot accomplish in Nigeria that you can get access to when you're abroad. Um, I travel out a lot and I spent about two years in England doing a course. When I was in that place, there are, so, there are lots of things I was able to get for my people back home. We were able to start a literary festival in 2019. That literary festival is still on till now i was able to go for some workshops with some of the most brilliant scholars from around the world now if i was to go to england for that workshop from nigeria it would cost me so much money in fact i don't even have the opportunity because i just got this information oh this man is in oxford and i just said okay fine i'll go to oxford within two hours i was in oxford so I was able to build my capacity based on my being there. I think the problem with Jack Bain now is where we just go once and for all and we forget our, our home. Sound Sultan of Blessed Memory said, no matter where we go, may we remember our area. As long as we are going and remembering our area, as long as we know that this is towards bettering ourselves and bettering our people, then it will be good for us. Because if we go there and totally forget our home, Nobody's going to repair our home for us. So we are going so that we can get better experiences, establish our home, build bigger bridges and connections so that in the end it will be better for all of us. And who knows, maybe one day we don't need to, our children we don't need to jack by again. Really? Do I really care? Ah. I would answer that with a story because I mean, literature is basically about telling stories. We did, when we, when we did the Benue Book and Arts Festival this year, there was someone who sent us a message that she wanted to come for the uh, festival, but she did not have money. So what we were able to do as a team was we sent money to her, covered her transportation, parts of her accommodation. We also spoke to a few other people, gave them scholarships, bursary to come for the, um, for the festival. This was detrimental to our pocket. It was a bit painful. It was this and that. But something happened after the festival. She sent us a message. She, uh, she thanked us profusely and told us that she was on the verge of committing suicide. She was very depressed and things were not going right for her. But when she came to the festival and she got some of these books and she was also able to meet with all the people that were there, she had a new lease on life. And right now, she's beginning to see life more differently. This is what literature does for people. 
many times we might think that it's just a book we are writing or we are just doing a festival or something, but you do not know what that one word you've written somewhere can do to anybody. But to um, give another very short example, before things fall apart, the view that the uh, Europeans and Americans had of Africa was very, very interesting. They thought that we were like animals, that we were monkeys hanging by our tail. But by the time they read Things Fall Apart, by the time most people read Things Fall Apart, they get to realize that there's more to life, there's more to Africa than this, uh, their perceived thought. They get to realize that we had a pre-colonial history. And that's what works like mine do too. They, they tend to document history. They tend to seek to also open the minds of people. They, send, they tend to heal. In essence, when you read a word, it's like when you read the Bible, all these sort of things. There are certain words you read over there that get into your spirit. And then you know that, okay, if this guy can say this, or if this word is coming this way, then perhaps it can be better. One of my biggest influences in writing has been a man called Hygienius Ekwazi, Professor Hygienius Ekwazi. He's an amazing man. Interestingly, he has been on the um, long list, and I think short list once, for NLNG once or twice. I read his collection, Dawn into Moonlight, All Around Me Dawning, and it opened my mind to, my mind to the possibilities of writing before then, I had been taught by people like Professor Moses Tsenongu, Dr. Maria Ajima, and I had friends like Sam Ogabidu who were teaching me or in coaching me, so to say, mentoring me on writing. But reading Hygienus Equazi's work opened me to far more. Um, there's also the works of Chuma Nwokolo and one of my favorite writers, Carlos Ruiz Zafon, Shadow of the Wind. So um, I'm sure I can go on and on talking of people like Umar Sidi, Basha Muneni, and Richard Ali. All of them, their works have kept on inspiring me. But I mean, for in terms of dominant inspiration, these are the ones that I would mention for now. Oh, yeah. Leadership for me is being able to find solutions and create enabling environment to implement those solutions to meet gaps in society. Because there are always gaps wherever it is you go to. If you're able to find solutions, number one, and then create the environment to implement these solutions, and then number three, very importantly, create a team and also find a way to replicate yourself. That's in essence, build other leaders then you are a true leader because leadership is more than just being one person. It's more than just being able to take all the glory and go somewhere and say, oh, I've done this, and then you move. Because that's one of the major problems we have in most societies, including our country, where you have one good person who comes at a time, does so many things, and by the time that person goes, it's almost as if um, the person never came. Because if, you, if your successor is somebody who is really terrible, the person can destroy all your legacies and everything you've built in just one second. So that's my own view of leadership, being able to find solutions or create solutions to problems. That's one. Number two, implement those solutions by having people with you, of course, building a team. And most importantly, creating leaders so that they can also do the same thing because if one person can't do it alone in society as long as we have various leaders doing things hand by hand we'll be able to have a better society um one of my biggest leadership influence would be my late foster father mr charles ayede and of course my mother um because my mom is someone who had to take care of us almost single-handedly all through most of what i know in life i've learned it from her my wife is another person who inspires my leadership sense and skill. Uh, and then uh, one of my sisters, Jennifer Duro. So for me, largely, leadership has been from the family ground. Naturally, there are other people from outside, like John C. Maxwell, Brian Tracy, who have inspired me. But I think the greatest leadership uh, strengths I have are from the people around me. What's the way to make it? Mm. 
good? Yes, yes, I do. Everybody has a uh, solution to Nigeria's problem. Nigeria's problem is very simple, and Chino Achebe said it best. Chino Achebe said the problem of Nigeria is squarely leadership. And if you look at it from that point of view, and following the same thing I just said, if our leaders can do the right thing, our country will be changed. The problem now is we always keep on hoping on one messiah. We hope that, oh, we'll have that one president that will just come and transform things. But leadership is not like that. You need somebody who, one, would inspire, create those solutions, and then build other people. Nigeria's problem is structural. In essence, if we have a president who is doing things, he's just doing it. It's not just the president. At any level, think of it. If you have a commissioner or a governor or a local government chairman who is really good, the person will come, and within four years, the person will transform places. You, For instance, if you go to... Uh, rivers, you hear, oh, Wiki is doing infrastructure, he's doing this and that and that. If you go elsewhere, you hear of the things these people are doing. But immediately they go. The person who comes after might come and crash everything. So our problem now is we need leaders who would create structures to continue what they have started as long as those are good things. We need people in the National Assembly, for instance, who would be able to implement laws that would ensure that if somebody is corrupt, for instance, instance the person would pay the full penalty but the problem now is the people in the national assembly know that yes if they are to bring in some of these laws it would affect them they wouldn't be able to chop as much as they want to so eventually they'll just allow things to be the way they are if nigeria can stand up and decide to change its structure change its laws and importantly implement them things will change for us the second thing we can all do is for all of us as a people to begin to change our attitude. Nigeria has generally believed that the only way change can come to the country is if Buhari brings change. But as has we said several times, several times, several times, change begins with us. It's about you over there deciding that, okay, in my own house, I'm going to ensure that my children do not steal, my children are not corrupt. I myself, I wouldn't be corrupt. I wouldn't do anything. You don't need to wait for anybody to police you. But any Nigerian who is put in a certain position, the person taking that, oh, this is my time to chop. And then the country keeps dabaroing, if I can use that term. I Advice to them would be, one, they need to read a lot. Because to be a good writer, you must be a very good reader. So you keep on reading Read as wide as you can. Read American literature, Nigerian literature. Read Chino Achebe, Shoenka, all these people. Read European literature. Read the classics. And then they would need to write. Because as long as you do not write, then you are not a writer. As long as you are not writing, you cannot improve. Another thing is they, sh they would need to be patient. The major problem is most writers these days are very impatient. They just write something and they just believe that, oh, this thing is good. They, put it, they push it into the market. But writing is something that takes time. You write your first draft, you go through it, you meditate, you read more, you go through it again, you edit if it needs editing, and you give other editors. So if you need to, you pay for, you pay for the editorial service. And when that is done, you go through it again and you give it time. But most importantly, um, other than just reading and reading and reading and writing and revising, there's also the need for them to invest in their work. Most people don't sacrifice or invest in their work, and yet they are hoping to get returns from it, which is almost impossible. Even the Bible says, what you sow, you will reap. You cannot, sow, um, you cannot plant, for instance, mango and expect that you'll get an apple. So it's what you put into the work that you to get what most of our writers need to learn to do despite the travails despite the hardship in nigeria is they need to somehow somehow find a way to invest in their writing by going for workshops joining associations there are several associations like the association of nigerian authors the nigerian literary society readers association all these things are everywhere around us in nigeria for us to grow we need to plug into them and we need to do the other things i mentioned and then when you're through with it pray to god because it's only god that can give success overall Ooh, with all these errands to 
let's do that. Every day. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to say. Um, it depends. It depends. Now, you can live on writing, but it is not advisable to work towards living on writing. Mainly because in Nigeria, the structures are not really there to support writing that much. So while you're working towards living on writing, you need to have your side hustle. So um, as a writer, you can decide to also be an editor, editing page. You can decide to write articles. You can decide to become an autobiographer, a biographer. But most of these things are things that don't just come in one second. And sometimes they are occasional. So while you might, one, um, you know, your writing might give you a million naira. But a million naira is not going to sustain you for the rest of your life. It's possible you get one million naira once in a year. But that one million is not going to take you throughout the whole year. The abuse you have to pay. So it's always good to have a side hustle so that when writing is not paying, at least you can fall back on that one. If not, you die of depression. At home and outside, I hold a duty to self to care. I know why I'm here. The prize, it's a brilliant prize. Several of us have always thought that it would be really good if there was something given to the second and the third because where's the winner take it all? It's really painful because you have three people who have come far, three people who are hoping and... Well, let's, let's even say 11. You have 11 on the long list. And then three on the short list. And then when you get to that final point, only one person takes the whole money. So the rest of the people, there's this sort of pain that I'm sure they would feel. So we've always been of the suggestion, and several people have said it through the years, that it might be good to give the um, second and third something, no matter how small, and then give some compensation to the long-listed people. Because it's almost as if once the once it gets to the shortlist, all the long listed people are forgotten. Pata, pata. Because if you check this whole period, immediately we came to the shortlist, nobody's mentioning the long listed people again, which is painful. So if somehow the price can get to recognize some of these people, or at least still put something once in a while, so that it's not as if they are totally forgotten, it will be good. But in terms of impact, the NLNG Nigeria Prize for Literature is one of the biggest prizes for literature in the whole world. It has transformed the lives of authors. It has brought popularity to them. It has also increased their worth. In this year alone, my books have been able to sell more because I'm on the short list. I've been able to have three readings, three major readings directly tied to the NLNG. We had the first one in Lagos for the long listing. We had the second one in Port Harcourt only last week. And Tied to that long, uh, the one we had in Port Harcourt, some other writers, some other associations, um, like the Nigerian Literary Society, as headed by uh, King David Chukweke, decided to host me to another one. So these opportunities have kept on coming. So what this prize does is it opens doors for writers. And if you're someone who is committed to writing far more, I'm sure it will be able to create more doors. The only issue is, there are some people who have other aspirations. They are not typically writers alone. Because like I mentioned, you need a side hustle. There are some people whose side hustle is far bigger. In fact, for them, it's the writing that is a side hustle. So someone who is a lecturer, an educationist, or a doctor, for instance, once that person wins the prize, the person is going to continue with their main occupation. So in the end, it begins to look like the prize has not affected that person. But yes, it did affect the person, but the person has their normal life that they are living. In summary, what do I think of the prize? I think it's a brilliant prize. I think if it is adjusted a bit to also take care of some other people, it would be far more brilliant. But so far, so good. I mean, they've done really well. And I know this for sure because I've seen the inner workings being a shortlisted writer. I can't really say all I would do, but I do know for sure that whether I win the prize or not, there are certain things I am doing that I will keep on doing. I am a steadfast writer, in essence. I even have a short story collection that I'm working on at the moment. I'm still going to keep on working on it. Um, there are several projects we've been working on. Like I told you, the Benue Book and Arts Festival, 
We are working on prizes. We are working on supporting authors. We are working in collaborations with um, several people like Africa Rights, Basha Muneni. All these things are things we are going to keep on doing, whether we win or not. But uh, um, we can only hope for the best. And best of all, um, I should mention this, the two other people on the list are my brothers, Romeo and Sadiq. We grew up together. We've written together. We've seen the pains of writing together. So any which way it goes, it's not something that is painful because it's definitely going to be in the family. And let me ask you a question back. As you are there, you know you are a beautiful work of art. It is definitely taken. Anybody will know it for, for sure that you've been designed. Your head didn't just appear like that. Your nose, everything. So God created, God designed you in this way before he created you. And more than that, he also designed the world. The way the world is, the world is beautiful. The world is deliberate. The world didn't just, boom, appear like that. So I mean, it only goes to show God is an artist. God is a designer. God is a poet. And God is the omniscient, the omnipotent, the amazing God. Oh, I'm the leadership of Gandhi. From my mother to Jesus. 